Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. It's ironic that I'm the one speaking today because I am the least capable of making any NFL jokes up here, but I do participate in uh, fantasy football mostly for my husband's sake so I can like stay engaged with the season. But also, I'm <clears throat> really competitive and I am not very good at fantasy football, but on the rare occasion that I win a game, I love beating boys at things that they're I'm really crazy passionate about that I'm not very good at. So. That's pretty funny to me. So for those of you that have only seen my face on the screen on Sunday mornings, like Mike mentioned, my name is Kiana. Um, I am married to our amazing worship pastor, Grant. Um, I joke around that I am a Sunday morning widow because I usually show up alone with or with my baby girl that we welcomed in our family this last Sunday. So um, I'm a proud stay-at-home, work, full-time mom. I'm pretty good at multitasking, if you ask me. I own a wedding photography business, and I stay really busy traveling to take pictures for clients and for fun. So um, <clears throat> Grant and I have been around since the very beginning of this journey that is Revision Church. So I am super honored to be up here delivering a message this weekend. And I have every bit of confidence that God wants to just capture your attention this morning and to just teach you something new about what it means to follow him. So let's pray because I'm going to need all the help that I can get to make that happen for you guys. So God, thanks for um, just meeting us where we're at and just teaching us new things through your word. And um, I just pray that you would use me as a vessel to just um, connect with the people of Revision this morning and to just teach us something and um, let us experience you in a new way this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. Um, we are kicking off a brand new series, if you haven't noticed, called Paparazzi, Living in a World Where Everyone's Watching. And these next several weeks, we're going to be taking a look at the book of James and diving into some of the practical advice that the scripture has to offer about living more like Jesus. And most of the New Testament is heavy in theological um, text, but the book of James actually weighs more in um, practical advice for Christians. So before we go anywhere, I want to pay attention to like my favorite detail about the book of James, and that is that the author, James, is Jesus's brother. And he starts the entire book by introducing himself as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know about you guys, but what would your siblings have to do to convince you that they are the Messiah? And what would they have to do to convince you or pay you to introduce yourself as their servant? Are you guys with me? This is like hilarious to me, okay? Let's not glance over what siblings are actually like. All right, roughly in 49 AD was when this book was written, and just before this, Stephen had been stoned to death for his faith. So all the Christians in Jerusalem, um, in the Jerusalem church, had scattered all over the Mediterranean world, and they were meeting in different Jewish synagogues, and as their former mentor and leader of the church in Jerusalem, James writes to the persecuted church, this book of James, with some practical advice for how to live the way that God created them for in the midst of a really hard time for people that claimed to believe in Jesus. And they were in really hostile communities where it would be really easy to let um, intellectual agreement pass for true faith. Does that sound familiar in our world today at all? They um, were in really, really interesting communities. And so we're going to just dive into this, this instruction that James offers um, in the, over the next several weeks, which I'm really, really excited about and because um, I think it's really applicable for us in today's world. So some of you have heard bits and pieces of my story before. Um, I was born with a brain disorder called Chiari malformation, and essentially that means that the tonsils of your brain just protrude further down into your skull than they're supposed to. So you can see it um, in this picture. This is like a normal brain on the left, and this is what mine looks like on the right. You can kind of see that like how it's going down there. Um, and I never knew about it, nor did I have any reason to find it until I was in a car accident when I was 14 years old with four of my volleyball teammates. And after months and months of headaches and neck and back pain, dizziness, um, passing out, lightheadedness, you get the idea, um, we finally found that I had this brain condition. And what they would consider, or at least what I was told, like a bad Chiari was when it was like two or three millimeters too low in your skull. And there's no way of telling what mine was before the accident, but after the accident when we found it, my brain was 13 millimeters too low in my skull. 
So all of a sudden, I was dealing with my brain um, blocking the cerebral spinal fluid that flows throughout your body, and um, so it couldn't flow properly and causing a whole ordeal of problems. And to make a long list of a lot of symptoms very short, um, my parents and my doctors decided that it would be best if I went through with having major decompression brain surgery. I don't know about you guys, but brain surgery was not on my bucket list as a 14-year-old, and um, surgery did not make life any easier. It actually made it significantly harder for a long period of time. Um, for almost two years of my life, I couldn't handle sitting in a room with lights on. I couldn't listen to music above a humming level. I couldn't play sports like all of my friends. I lost the ability to come to school every day and participate in virtually everything that I ever had to fill my time before. Um, so I was too inconvenient for friends. And um, I loved achieving at things, but sports were taken away and school was taken away. So the only thing I had going for me were the friends that showed up every single day when I popped in the 10 seasons of DVDs on my TV. So that was, I'm thankful for that. The pain was real overwhelming and it was far beyond my physical body. Um, so after my surgery, I was laying in my hospital bed in my room, um, or in the hospital room in my bed. Um, in the months leading up to that, I was completely isolated from people, which if you've spent more than three seconds with me, you know that that is just about my worst nightmare because I do not like being alone. Um, and anyways, so in this moment, I was sitting in my hospital bed, and this was one of the few times in my life that I have ever heard like the audible voice of God, which if you've ever experienced that before, you do not forget it. Um, what I would have expected to hear in that moment was like 10th Avenue North, like this is where the healing begins, but like that's not what happened. Instead, I just kept on hearing this on repeat. Consider it joy. Consider it joy. Like, I just had brain surgery. Consider it joy. I was only 15 at that point, but I don't believe in a junior Holy Spirit, and if you're skeptical, I swear you would have heard it too if you were sitting right next to me. I had a lot of downtime in that season, and it's almost impossible to go through a trying season in your life in a Christian community without reading or talking about or being like encouraged by James 1 verses 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I knew exactly what God was talking about. Consider it joy. There's a reference to instructions from James well, you want to know what, God? I really don't need the positive outlook right now. I would rather take these pain meds, sit in my sorrow, and watch friends for the rest of my life. You're all maybe laughing inside at me, but I know I'm not the only one who has walked through something beyond my control and extremely difficult. Some of us are just getting out of really, really hard seasons, and some of you are in the thick of it right now. And for some of you, the season ahead is looking a little grim, or maybe it eventually will. And it's the most human response to think that anyone that has any kind of positive, positive advice to offer during that time is maybe insensitive or inexperienced. And I have to think that many of you that have walked through anything difficult, if you were in my shoes in the hospital bed, would have been thinking similar thoughts like, is this pain good for something? When will it end? Why do these idiots in my life keep saying irrational things like I should be joyful right now? All those thoughts are valid and real and human, but I think there's maybe some answers that we can get from the book of James, so I'm excited to dive into that this morning. Go ahead and pull out your smartphones, your dumb phones, whatever has been instilled with the Holy Spirit, so you can follow along with me in the book of James. If you are vintage and have a real Bible, you're going to find the book of James in the very back, um, just a few chapters before you hit Revelation. And if you don't have a Bible, um, we have tons of them in the back at that fancy table back there. We have one with your name on it. If you'd like to grab one on the way out, it is our gift to you. So for the rest of you who are like super lazy, the words will be up on the screen, so you're welcome. All right, <laughs> James chapter 1, here we go. Verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Okay, so let's remember who James is talking to. All these Christians were in Jerusalem with James. They witnessed their friend Stephen having thrown, stones thrown at him for so long, he literally died because he believed in who they believed in. They flee all over the country. Clearly, these people are going through a bit of a rough patch in their life. And they have difficulties confronting them left and right, but most of all, they're at risk of being killed. And in the midst, James writes this, Verse 2, 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I'm going to read that again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever, notice he doesn't say if, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm just going to go ahead and say that James is being like a little too much like my Enneagram 7 husband who like always loves to remind me of like the half of the glass that is so full, even though I'm like so salty about my circumstances. Um, So sometimes when I really don't like what I'm reading in the Bible, I go and read the verse in like a different version of the Bible. I have yet to find an error, but like I always love to check. So anyways, we're going to go check that out in um, the message. Eugene Peterson translates this verse like this, consider it. A sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you may become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Am I the only one who gets sweaty after reading that? (laughs) Don't miss this. James is saying that under pressure, your faith is forced to show its true colors. When we are walking in uncharted territory, when we are facing our worst nightmares, when we've lost everything, he says that is when your faith shows its true colors. Anyone can, you know, say the right things, do the right things, and put on a Christian game face when the stars are aligning in your life, but that's not when our faith is the most transparent. The world around you is waiting for your season of despair, and I pray that when it comes, they'll witness a vast array of fruits built in who you are. And I think we can all agree that traveling different seasons of our lives forces us to get a different perspective of who God is. When we're in the valley, our vision tends to get a bit foggy. We get bogged down, and for the sake of this illustration, it's probably cold and it probably smells, you know. But God wants for us to appreciate our new perspective of him. Consider it joy that we get to grow through a new lens. Consider it an opportunity for joy. Now, joy is a confusing word that kind of gets thrown around a lot in today's world. And something I've learned is that sadness can exist in the same place as joy. I believe that joy can still um, leave space for disappointment and for grieving. But what I've learned in my experience is that when joy occupies our hearts, it will not coexist with worry and anxiety. Let me say that again. Joy does not coexist with worry and anxiety. You wonder why James would suggest having joy in trying seasons? Because when we posture ourselves for joy, our perspective of God is so big that fear and anxiety, they have to take the back seat. Notice how James does not say, consider being happy while you run for your lives. Consider being happy while you fight off cancer. If you would simply choose to be happy, even though you got laid off, it wouldn't be so bad. No, he says joy because joy is a heart posture. It's a posture we get to choose that does not change with our circumstances. It's a posture we get to choose to put ourselves in. And I believe it's optimum for learning and being transformed and molded by him. Unfortunately, transformation and suffering, they come in a pair. You know, you can't buy one gold toe without getting a second. And you can't experience transformation in your life without going through a bit of suffering. So then why do we run from hurt? We run from trials and we run from conflict. When we, but when we look at the Bible and the stories that are in it, suffering went hand in hand with transformation. It's hard, obviously. Life has a way of kicking us when we're down sometimes. And if I got to choose mountaintop or valley, I would choose the bird's eye view every single day of the week. Even Jesus did not like the hard things. He knew the pain that was ahead as he walked to the cross And he prayed this. He said, Lord, take this cup from me, not my will, but yours. He was dreading what was ahead, but he walked in obedience anyways. And thank God he did for our sake. So then how do I go about doing this? I want to be obedient, but how? 
Let's keep going in chapter um, 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The message puts it this way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. Jesus demonstrates this so well through his prayer. Lord, take this cup from me, not my will, but yours be done. Do you believe James here? He says that if you pray this, if you try this, but you don't believe, he says you won't get anything in return. So pray with authenticity and cry for help. In my experience, usually suffering comes with a bit of tears, so I just like to like redirect them right on up to the Lord. He compares our doubt to the waves of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. If you've ever watched the waves blow, you'll notice how easily they're subject to outside forces of wind and gravity. And James is saying that we, in our lack of faith, are willing to be persuaded by the world around us. We are easily pushed around in our unbelief. So pray with confidence to the Lord and trust that he knows what's best for you. There is nothing in God that prevents him from giving his wisdom to his people. The barrier can only exist in you. So when you ask, believe and not doubt. Your faith must be more than mere acceptance of the Christian rule book. Believing is having confidence that God can do more than what you're asking. And let's just like understand what we're asking for here. God's wisdom is practical, but is also divine. God's wisdom is applicable in our most trying times, and it's in divine that it goes beyond our common sense. If it were up to our common sense, there is 0% chance I would be choosing joy in the midst of really, really hard seasons. The divine wisdom from God takes us out of our perspective and brings us to obedience out of respect for his divinity. And in this context, wisdom is understanding the nature and perspective of trials and knowing how to meet them victoriously. So ask for God's wisdom. I think part of our problem is that we don't see the whole picture, and so joy seems incredibly too far out of reach. In our limited knowledge, we don't think that we're lacking in anything. We actually have these glasses on that give us a very narrow focal point. So God's seeing everything. This is what we get here. God's holding your hand and he's saying, trust me, I've got a plan. I can see it all and I can do it all because of my perspective. You have just got to trust me. And eventually, he says that we will be revealed to his glory and understand the purpose of our suffering when we get to be with him. But until then, We have to trust him in his wisdom. Trust him in his power because yours is surely limited. Obviously, our reward is heaven, but it's more than that. This testing is just that. It's a test. And we have access to the one who, the wisdom of the one who wrote the test. And he is promising us that if we make it through, if we withstand the test, we will be victorious because we'll experience the quality of life that he made us for here on this earth. And it's in the struggling against this difficulty and opposition that our spiritual stamina is developed and perseverance in trials um, absolutely develops maturity of our character. And he's going to give you tools that you need to live life to the fullest here on earth. If you are sitting in your chair this morning and you're like, well, my life's going pretty great, I just want to, you know, challenge you to not think that you're off the hook because James did not say if trials come. He said when. So you have the opportunity to make the decision now what kind of color will show when your faith is brought into the spotlight. If tomorrow you received a terrible diagnosis or your boss brought some bad news or maybe your spouse didn't come home, would you be proud of the faith that would be revealed? Make some choices now that will help you when the storms roll in. Get connected in a good community. It's really hard to start looking for that when you're down in the trenches, but you have the opportunity. Get in a house group. You can sign up in the back at the Next Steps table. Let them encourage you and hold your hand through a season of intense experiences and really hard trials in your future. 
Maybe you're in the midst of the rough right now. You need to find a way to direct the focus of your season. If the only sight that we have is limited, then I better be looking in the right direction. Think about how easy it would be if we were unintentional to be missing the mark when the roads get bumpy. If we left the direction of our heart up to our flesh, we would go so far off course it's not even funny. So we need reminders to direct the focus of your season back to the Lord. I personally, I literally had to uh, paint my reminder on my bedroom wall. I was spending day and night laying in bed while my body was confused and recovering. And a friend of mine had sent me like a super cheesy, you know, Christian worship video that I normally would have been like, oh yeah, thanks so much, and then probably like not watch. But I was desperate for help. So I listened to it and I like sobbed and I cried and, you know, sang along over and over. And during the instrumental of the video, they like flashed up these verses in that like magical like Star Wars text like that. You guys know what I'm talking about. That's when you know worship video is like amazing. All right. So then um, anyway, so I remember reading one of them and it was Romans 8.18 and it said this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. And it hit me that I needed this over and over and over every single day. I needed this to remind myself to direct the focus of this season. Because if I don't, I'm going to end up in a situation that I would not be proud of. Reading this verse reminded me of the end goal that there is glory that will be revealed. My focus will not go there on my own. I have to remind myself. So anyways, I immediately got out of my bed after um, reading that verse, and I grabbed a paintbrush and some paint, and I painted it right on the wall of my bedroom that you'll see in a second here. Yeah, there we go. That's literally a picture of my bedroom wall at home. Um, So yeah, I painted it right on the wall of my bedroom, and it stayed there on my wall um, until I moved out several years and then got married, you know. Um, Anyways, and it ended up being an anthem for me as I look back on it. I made songs about it. I traced it in the middle of tears and hurting. Um, But most importantly, I reminded myself so many times that eventually I started believing it. Find ways to remind yourself of the future that God has for you because your vision is surely limited and it will fail you but God's will not. Write scripture where you're going to see it often. Tell Siri to remind you every single day of your favorite verse from that worship song that moves you. Get in front of God's truth for your life on a daily basis. What if we choose to ignore what James is saying here? What if we believe that this is just him being overly optimistic and joy absolutely could not be possible in the midst of what you're going through? I love Job's example in the Old Testament. If you're not familiar with the story, he lost his kids, which I had a baby this summer, like I mentioned. She was in the NICU for the first several days of her life, so I, that thought has gone through my mind, and I just cannot even imagine. So that alone seems brutal to me, but he loses his kids, his family. He loses everything he owns. And the thing that he says after that is what gives me hope for you and I. He says this, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can't say that after you've lost your entire life running on happiness. That right there is a perspective of joy, and I believe it's available for us too. If James is right in saying that faith under, or that under pressure your faith shows its true colors, then Job's faith is looking like the most epic rainbow that you've ever seen. And I want this for you so badly. When we allow trials to crush us. They rob the future that God has for us. But James says in verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I made a mistake in the middle of my hurting of assuming that God had forgotten about me. Like he made an error or didn't know what was happening maybe because he was too busy doing other things. It's really easy to do and think. I can't be the only one that's ever asked, why me? And where is God? But the funny thing looking back is that he was there all along. He just showed up differently than I was expecting. 
And he didn't instantly take away the pain because he understood that I needed to walk through it to prune my character for what he had in store for me in the future. Have you guys ever been to one of those escape rooms? They're actually super, super fun, but I can see why you would only want to go with people you like because you could get on each other's nerves really, really quickly. Um, you're locked in a room and all together, and the idea is to solve a series of clues, each solve giving you what you need uh, for your next clue, so eventually leading to your escape, hence escape room. The puzzles seem to kind of come full circle, and the mysteries you solve later on become easier because of the knowledge you acquire in earlier scenarios. Would you believe me if I told you that God has some mysteries for you down the road? And what you're experiencing right now is giving you the tools that you need to live the life that he's going to call you to later on. Don't miss out on an opportunity to grow now because the pain of your present is preparation for your future. If you choose to turn to the world in the midst of the valley, they're going to feel the fire of your flesh. But God wants to grow us for the future during the pain of our present. He wants to give purpose and reason to your darkest days and your brightest. Your suffering is not without a cause, and God will carry you through if, you're, if you keep your eyes locked on him, and he will blow your mind with your obedience. Let's pray together. God, thank you for just having a grander perspective and giving us purpose when every bit of purpose seems lost in our life. Thank you for leading us and teaching us and guiding us, God, when the path is kind of uncharted territory. We are grateful for your guidance, God, and we are grateful that you meet us and um, that you comfort us in sorrow and in happiness, God. In your name I pray, amen.